Yeah, good morning. I hope you are up and running and mentally online. This next talk is something that touches my heart very deep. Sorry for that. It is about a person who, <clears throat> who followed her heart in two ways. One is realizing being transgender. The other one has political influences and leaking documents and um, taking all the risks, paying a very high price, and she did what she had to do. So this talk is about her and I pass over to her. Our panel today concerns an honorary member of the CCC who is imprisoned right now by the U.S. military at, in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Her name is Chelsea Manning. She is a young, trans U.S. Army whistleblower convicted to 35 years in prison in the summer of 2013 for disclosing documents to a media organization. Many of the victims of crimes and wrongdoing revealed in the documents that Manning disclosed are not members of a Western electorate. Her revelations do not affect the, the bottom lines of Silicon Valley tech firms, but they created the age that we live in and had impact from Tunisia to Berlin. Despite however effective US propaganda has been concerning Manning, and it has been very effective, the U.S. Department of Defense's own comprehensive review of every single document released by her determined the disclosures to be low to moderate risk. The allegations that she dumped documents irresponsibly is false. She was convicted under the Espionage and the Computer Fraud Abuse Acts for portions of 240 documents. A significant portion of those are unclassified. Over half a million U.S. government employees and federal contractors had access to the documents that Manning released. One of the documents that put Manning away in prison for 35 years relates to malaria updates in Kingston, Jamaica. Four years later, no one has been harmed. Her releases revealed or confirmed mass civilian casualties by U.S. forces in Afghanistan, U.S. complicity in the torture of detainees by Iraqi security forces, the existence of more children than we knew being held uh, and imprisoned at Guantanamo Bay prison camp, the training of death squads in Bangladesh by the UK, and so much more. Manning trusted us with her life when she appealed to the public conscience, and she also created her own hope. Our own lives, I believe, depend on the hope that we create for her. I'm very honored today to be able to discuss her two pending legal matters um, with her attorneys, and they're going to come up on Skype now, hopefully. <laughs> Nancy Hollander, who is currently a th a coming back to us, is a preeminent American criminal defense attorney who specializes in national security cases. She represents prisoners held at Guantanamo Bay and has argued before the Supreme Court in the United States. Ahmed Gapoor is a renowned American law professor who specializes in the intersection of technology and national security. He directs a litigation clinic at UC Hastings that addresses constitutional issues that arise from espionage, counterterrorism, and computer hacking cases. Kapoor is also the attorney to the imprisoned American journalist Barrett Brown, currently awaiting sentencing in Texas, uh, January 22nd. Everyone should make sure to show their support. Chase Stronzio is a staff attorney with the ACLU LGBT and AIDS project. He specializes in the litigation of incarcerated trans people like Chelsea Manning. I, um, I see that Nancy is, is having a bit of a technical difficulty. So Ahmed, I'm going to actually, um, Chase, I'm going to actually ask you, can you explain what it means to say that Manning is trans and that she's suing the Department of Defense to get adequate medical treatment? Uh-oh. Hold on. Can you... 
so we can't hear you. We can't hear you. So let's figure out what's going on with that. <laughs> can you hear us? Oh God. Das lass es bitte. Ich ich krieg auch nichts. Also es kommt aus dem Skype gar nichts raus. Da kann, nein, das ist nicht aktiv. <coughs> so can you okay. say something? I think I heard somebody. Can you say something now? <laughs> can you say something, please? Uh, this, yes. This is Chase. Thank God. Can you hear Chase? I can hear Chase. Chase, please tell us what does it mean when Manning says that she's a trans, she's trans, and that she's suing the Department of Defense for adequate medical care. Um, so. It, Chelsea has been trans her entire life. It means that she, even though she was assigned the sex of male at birth, that she has been always uh, a female and that um, she has a female gender identity and the incongruence between her male assi assigned sex at birth and her female gender identity has caused her uh, significant uh, distress and continues to cause her significant distress. And the condition, the medical condition that she has been diagnosed with is called gender dysphoria. And even though this is a widely recognized medical condition with accepted standards of care, the military has continued and persists on not recognizing the Chelsea's need for treatment. Now, the military first diagnosed her with gender dysphoria in 2010 and has since diagnosed her over seven times with gender dysphoria. Um, so when the day after she uh, was sentenced and she came out publicly as transgender and indicated that she would be requesting treatment for gender dysphoria, even though this was her first big public announcement about this, the military had known for over three years that she was transgender. Um, sorry, some distractions here. Uh, but she, um, she, so, so when she arrived at, at Fort Leavenworth in, in, in Kansas, the first thing she did was request treatment for gender dysphoria. And that included for her uh, access to hormone therapy uh, to bring her body into alignment with her female gender and access to uh, the ability to grow her hair and, and dress uh, and, and groom in accordance with female grooming standards. Now, the military uh, from that day forward took the position that they would not treat her gender dysphoria, despite the fact that courts in the United States have continually held that failure to treat gender dysphoria is a violation of the right of prisoners to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. It was clear from the start that the military was going to take a position, one that we consider to be unconstitutional, that they would not provide Chelsea with treatment, even though they knew for, you know, at this point, over four years that she had this medical condition. And she uh, continued to fight for her treatment. Uh, the first thing she did when she arrived at Leavenworth is ask for treatment. We were in touch with her from the, from the very beginning upon her arrival. She filed grievances. She did everything in her power uh, to try to get the treatment initiated, something that she considered to be central to her survival while she served her 35-year sentence. Uh, and something that, you know, in her words, was the single most important thing to her, even more so than her appeal, beginning uh, from the day she was sentenced. And she um, continued to fight for it. And when it was clear that the military was not going to budge, they were not going to take her medical condition seriously, she reached out to the ACLU and we decided that we would need to uh, formally represent her in a lawsuit against the Department of Defense. And so we, um, you know, Chelsea initiated the, the contact and we began uh, the preparations to file a lawsuit. And we are now suing the Department of Defense, um, including uh, officials from Hegel uh, to the, 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 ind the individuals who are administering her medical care at Fort Leavenworth, uh, requesting that she be provided with medically necessary treatment in accordance with the, the Army's uh, obligation under the Constitution. Can you, can you help educate... Can you help educate us? How does Manning wish to be represented? How does she wish to be referred to? Can you just help clarify that for the public? Because there seems to be a, a bit of confusion generally. Yeah, I think the most important thing um, from Chelsea's perspective, and this has been true for a very long time, is that she is a woman and, and sort of recognizing that core part of ident her identity, which is as fundamental as anyone's gender is to them, as a woman is absolutely critical to her survival. I mean, she's looking at being incarcerated now for decades potentially, and she's 
you know, every time her picture or any rep- likeness of her is presented in as male or any time anyone refers to her by her former name or with male pronouns, it's, it's a further sort of erasure of who she is as, at her core. And I think I, I, there was a lot of reports when she was um, during her, her court martial about one of her greatest fears when she was arrested was that for the rest of her life, images of her as a boy would be circulated globally. And that is absolutely something that just pains her and causes her so much distress. And I think what we can do to honor her is continue to recognize her as the woman that she is and make sure that our narratives of her centralize that part of her identity. Thank you for telling us. Thank you for telling us that. All right, uh, Ahmed, you are going to help us to understand I just spent um, a month uh, traveling through Spain with Amnesty, trying to raise awareness about M- Manning's uh, trial, uh, the, the unfair nature of her trial, the, the prejudicial, oh, thank you, <laughs> um, the, uh, the fact that she was convicted to 35, year, 35 years in prison for um, essentially leaking low-level battlefield reports that over half a million U.S. government employees had access to. Talk to me about the use of the Espionage Act in political persecutions and prosecutions in the United States, generally speaking. So, um, uh, thank, th- thanks to, to begin with. Thanks for, for having us. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to try to talk as slow as possible just because Nancy, I, I see her trying to connect every once in a while and she'd kill me if I said something wrong. Um, but let me just let me just talk about what the Espionage Act is supposed to do in very broad terms. Um, the Espionage Act is supposed to punish folks for spying for the enemy, for selling state secrets for personal gain, for trying to undermine the democratic fabric that enables uh, our way of life. And now I will pass it along to Nancy. <laughs> Lucia. We're so glad so- you're here, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, something happened to my internet in my place. That's, that's fine. Ahmed was just talking to us generally about the Espionage Act and how it's used in political pr- uh, prosecutions. Good. I, I was just saying what it's supposed to be used for, so now I'm handing it off to you, Nancy. Well, what it's supposed to be used for, I don't know how far you got, but it was obviously intended for spies. It was written during World War I. Maybe Ahmed already told you that. Um, It was a bad law when it began, and it's a worse law now. The problem, the main problem with the Espionage Act is not so much the act, if you read it, but the way the courts have interpreted it, and the way the courts have interpreted it, not just in Chelsea Manning's case, but in many previous cases, is that the crime is committed when one discloses, intends to disclose, national security information. So it doesn't have to hurt the United States. It doesn't have to aid a foreign country. It certainly doesn't have to aid an enemy. It just is the act of disclosure. So it becomes what we call a strict liability crime. And there doesn't have to be any bad intent. There are two problems with this going in two directions. Obviously, it means that anyone, there is no defense for public interest. There's no defense for telling the public something the public needs to know. So there's no way an insider can ever disclose anything without getting caught up in this act if the government decides that it's a national security issue or it discloses national security information. That's much broader than just classified information. It's whatever the government decides at that time is national security information. And I want to give you an example that is just recently happened. There were five people from Guantanamo who were exchanged for a U.S. um, prisoner. We were told 
in the world that these particular five men who were supposedly members of the Taliban could never leave Guantanamo. They were what's known as forever prisoners because national security would be harmed if they were ever released. And then all of a sudden they're released and national security is okay. So it's that's a moving target and you never know where it is. So the person is caught up in that and that's what makes this law so dangerous. It's so broad from both directions. Uh, it's unconstitutional. It's a violation of free speech. And we have to stop it. That's the bottom line on the Espionage Act. Ahmed, is there anything you want to add on that? Well, um, I, I would just add, just underscore the, the potential for abuse here. Um, and, and essentially, the whole purpose of the laws is to be written in such a way that it, it doesn't allow the government to do exactly what Nancy is, is saying that they're doing. And, 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 and the Espionage Act is not supposed to be used as, as a vehicle for retaliation against whistleblowers. Um, of course, uh, it doesn't stop there, right? The Obama administration, what, what they've done is systematize the criminalization of whistleblowers. And I don't say that merely because only a, a, about a dozen people in American history have been charged with espionage for leaking classified information, and seven or eight of them under the Barack uh, Obama administration. Um, I say that because most recently the administration has brought them into the long war. And what I mean by that is that the, admin, the Obama administration has designated a new national security threat, the insider threat. Um, and categorizing it as a threat um, means that you've now got a broad line of power to play around with. And in the same way you can cast a wide net to find the next terror threat, the uh, government will do the same to prevent the next disclosure, to prevent the next public embarrassment. And because we can't tail every government employee out there, we'll just put pressure on journalists and uh, leak and, and generally transfer uh, privacy and, and, and transparency advocates. Advocates, And that's why there's a push uh, to get Congress to pass re legislation amending the Espionage Act and allowing the defenses such as public accountability and necessity. But as things stand, um, we're basically screwed. And the Obama legacy will forever be known as the presidency of secrecy. Now, won't it? So I, want to, I want to talk to you about what kind of recourse Manning has. I mean, she's been convicted to 35 years. She's currently being held in a military prison in Kansas. What kind of recourse does she have at this point? Well, of course, she can always ask for a pardon and will continue to always do that. She has parole uh, possibility in about, I think it's now about six or seven years. And of course, we will do that. But the main focus for me and for my partner, Vince Ward, and uh, the lawyers and the students, Ahmed students who are working with us and her detailed counsel, is her appeal. The, the appeal is to the Court of Appeals for the Army. Then there's another appeal to the Court of Appeals to the Armed Forces. And then there's an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. And then we start, actually, the habeas petition. But our focus on the first court is to raise every issue, espionage is only one of them, that we believe has merit. Um, and we will be writing briefs, we're reading the transcript. This is the longest transcript in military history, so I'm told. It's huge. It's 111 volumes. Each one is 330 pages. So it is a huge record. It's going to take us time to get it all read, read all the exhibits. Some of it's classified. Classified, we have to go to Washington to read. Uh, but that's our real focus, is to write the very best appeal to argue. I'll be arguing this case, to argue this case and convince the judges that Chelsea did not receive a fair trial, which she clearly didn't, because of the Espionage Act and because of a host of other reasons. Do you have, uh, what are some possible appellate issues other than the Espionage Act? Well, some of the obvious ones are the pretrial confinement issues. Um, the, the UN rapporteur considered some of her pretrial confinement to actually 
rise to the level of torture. It was clearly um, cruel and inhumane treatment, the way she was treated at Quantico, <coughs> excuse me, and in Kuwait. There was one point where she was forced to stand naked at attention. There was no purpose to that other than to demean her. Um, she was put on suicide watch when she clearly was not a suicide risk. And the psychiatrist kept saying that, but the prison did it. That's a big issue. There's a speedy trial issue. Did it take too long to have her trial? This is a bigger issue actually in the military and the law is stronger for the defendant in the military than it is in our federal courts. And that's probably because people move around a lot in the military. But there are some military laws that are helpful to her in that argument. And there are other issues. There was not, she didn't have witnesses she should have had. Um, the military gets to decide which witnesses are necessary and relevant. And the prosecution even gets to chime in on that, which I find somewhat absurd, but that's the way they do it in the military. So there were <laughs> uh, lots of witnesses she didn't get to have. That's a big issue. There are there were discovery issues. Uh, there are, are issues of what was the value of what she took. Was it under a thousand dollars or over a thousand dollars? And how did they value it? And all of these things added up to charges that added up to time. So we have a lot of issues um and and others then we'll be deciding which ones are the ones that we want to include in our brief and that'll happen as we go along Ahmed tell me Ahmed. why did you, uh, you know, what, what brought you to this case uh you, you the UC your, the litigation clinic that you direct at UC Hastings is actually now working with the defense the appellate attorneys uh, tell me how you came to this case and why you think it's important um, well, I came, I came to the case, obviously everybody knows about this case, um, and uh, Nancy and I have worked together, I can't say how long, it would reveal how young I am, but um, <laughs> for, for years, and, and uh, it, it really is, a, it, it's a great case for students because it's an appeal and we can look, really digest all the issues. Um, it's also uh, the kind of case that encompasses everything that the clinic does, and, and the clinic at, at UC Hastings, um, basically, it's meant to, to focus on the future of security, which is technology, and the future of technology, which is security, and we see it, the first real case to, to encompass all that in the United States, I think, is, the, is Chelsea's case, um, the first real broad uh, dragnet type of investigation um, to 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 follow up on that is the WikiLeaks investigation. Um, so hopefully we'll be doing some work on that too. Um, I think this is probably one of the most important cases around right now. Period. Um, for a vast number of reasons, not only because of the the unconstitutionality of the application of the Espionage Act, um, but also because of the um, the sort of the sort of message that it was meant to send. Uh, to folks like Edward Snowden, you know, and, and luckily that message fell on deaf ears. Chase, I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, Nancy was talking about Manning's pretrial uh, treatment at Quantico, and in the public record there is examples of prison officials referring to her underwear that they took from her as panties, um, homophobia, uh, certainly a transphobia. In your opinion, did Manning being transgendered or did transphobia in general impact her court martial and how so if it did? Well, I think first of all, the, the, the mistreatment of detainees and prisoners by the United States government is certainly not limited to transgender individuals. But I think transgender individuals in custody do experience uh, particular hardships and particular cruelty that I think Manning herself was subjected to. Now, again, even though we didn't know publicly, or most people didn't know that Manning was transgender uh, until after her sentencing, the military did know uh, as far back as 2010 and did know through her entire court martial. And so I think uh, this affected her in a number of ways, the first of which was that she was forced to uh, really uh, minimize a critical part of her identity for a long period of time that had incredible 
uh, challenges for her that created a significant amount of distress through the court martial, which just impacted her ability to continue to be an advocate for herself. Now, that's not to say that she wasn't an incredible advocate and did not survive unbelievably horrific conditions, but she did. Um, and then in the other ways, of course, that the, the military used that it, it, to, to further dehumanize her and to mock her and to belittle her in what were already horrific conditions. And I think this is something that transgender people in prison and you know outside of custody experience all the time. And this was something that Chelsea herself experienced uh, throughout the horrible times that she was de detained, uh, particularly at Quantico. Um, and I think what's important to remember is that, you know, she, this part of her identity was so important and that she has taken on unbelievable risk in continuing to fight for her fair treatment as a transgender person in a context and an environment where transgender people are not taken seriously. And as she fights her appeal, uh, the fact that she is willing to sort of stand up for transgender people and put herself out there is an incredible testament on top of everything else that she has done to the kind of person that she is. I just want to interject here. I have never seen a more earnest and thoughtful and reasoned person under that amount of stress. I mean, she's an extraordinary individual and she deserves every person's support. I wanted to talk to you, uh, Ahmed, about your other client, Barrett Brown, um, Barrett wasn't charged with the CFAA, the, sorry, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, like Manning, but he was charged sort of similarly in the sense with hacking statutes that sort of ended up being part of a larger dragnet. Can you talk to me, first of all, what is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act? So the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is the federal anti-hacking law. Um, amongst other things, the law criminalizes unauthorized access of a computer. Um, of course, the law doesn't explain what without authorization means. So initially the purpose, uh, while initially the purpose was to combat cyber terrorism, believe it or not, which is the hacking of computers of the federal government, as the way of things go, the criminal conduct covered by the statute has broadened significantly. And so what we have now is a uh, CFAA or the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act where creative prosecutors can take advantage of the confusion and bring criminal charges that aren't really about hacking a computer at all. Um, but that essentially criminalize behavior that prosecutors don't like. So for example, um, the government has claimed that violating a private agreement or corporate policy amounts to a hacking violation or a CFA violation. Uh, in the Manning case, the government essentially argued that writing a script to do something efficiently was exceeding authorized access. In this case, the script or the program was we'll get. Um, and this shouldn't be the case. So, uh, of course, there's a, there's a joke about the military being inefficient in there, but I'm not going to make it. Um, but compounding the problem is the sentencing issues with the, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, because um, you can get anywhere, the prosecutors can seek anywhere between 5 and 10 and 20 years and even life depending on the amount of damage or financial uh, loss that was caused, um, which, of course, is disastrous. Um, as for Barrett's case, so Barrett was not a hacker at all. He has absolutely no computer skills. Everybody in the world knows that. Um, he was a journalist uh, that happened to cover uh, you know, what one might call the accidental cyber, cyber war between the US government and, and Anonymous. Of course, there was no such war, and there is no such group as anonymous. It's just a collective as opposed to, you know, like the Taliban or something. So by way of background, um, at, at the time of the uh, conduct that was alleged, he'd found a collaborative web publication called Project PM. Uh, Project PM's purpose was to bring people together to conduct research on publicly available materials that were put forth into the public sphere by whistleblowers, leakers, hackers, and so on. Um, Project PM's reports came to focus on the military and intelligence contracting industry. In December of 2011, about 5,000 emails from Stratford Global Intelligence uh, were exfiltrated by um, Jeremy Hammond, amongst others. And by others, I mean including the FBI, because Sabu was involved and he was um, an FBI informant who essentially ran 
uh, many of those operations, but that's a whole other story. So the files contained revelations about close and inappropriate ties between the government security agencies and private uh, contractors. Uh, the emails I should also mention are, are available now um, on WikiLeaks. Uh, so amongst the millions of Stratford files were data containing credit card information and other security codes, part of the vast trove of the internal company documents that Stratford, of course, forgot to encrypt. Um, the credit card data was no interest to Barrett because that's not really what he's into, but it was of great interest to the government because in December of 2012, he was charged with 12 counts related to identity theft. I should mention that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act initially was called something like the Computer Fraud and Identity Theft Act or something. It, 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 it essentially in, in incorporated the, the two statutes that come before it. Um, and they were passed around the same time. So it, it, it is a hacking violation that he was initially charged with. He was charged with 12 counts related to identity theft for cutting and pasting a hyperlink that led to the, uh, um, the public website that contained a gzip file um, uh, containing that, the dump of the hack. Um, of course, since then, we've challenged the charges on grounds that linking to information that is already in the public sphere is nothing more than pure news gathering activity. And that the government in essence was criminalizing journalism. Two days after we filed our motion to dismiss, uh, the government uh, on their own uh, dismissed 11 out of the 12 charges. And he, will, he, he was to be sentenced a few days ago, but the judge has delayed sentencing for a month. It's a very, very long way to describe an even longer case. It's been going on forever. In, in, in Manning's case, you, you had someone who used WGET to download 116 diplomatic cables. Um, according, I'm not a lawyer, but according to my observation in the trial, the, the judge appeared to, it was difficult to sort of know exactly what her sort of legal thought was because she didn't produce what was called a special findings. But from her pretrial orders, she appeared to sort of rule that it was because uh, Manning uh, exceeded her, um, uh, violated her terms of service for the DOD network, that the Department of Defense network, by using WGET, that she um, also violated her uh, security clearance and she, there was an automated sort of process of using WGET to download 116 cables. It seems to me, though, that the government was trying to sort of fabricate a hacking charge where it didn't exist. Is the CFA always used uh, to prosecute hackers or to, I'm sorry, to ha the act of hacking, or is it used actually to prosecute publication or disclosure? I mean, I, I, that's, a, that's a really good question, and the problem is it, it, it all turns on the confusion. So whenever the government has a statute or a law that contains a confusing term or um, a confusing sort of idea or deals with some sort of confusing or difficult or technical concept like computers, um, they can get really creative. And they can tell a judge, well, you know, this thing called we get or we get or W get is really an automated process to exfiltrate information from a server. And it's not, it's just a way to automate. It's like a script that automates a task of go and collect something and come back. And it's completely legal. Um, but you know, when you put that kind of narrative in front of a judge, um, that was born before the idea of a computer ever existed, um, y you, you get into situations where there's uh, unfortunate, um, reliance just on, on, on whatever the assertions are. Um, on the flip side, and this isn't uh, necessarily uh, talking about the Manning case, but generally, I mean, we see these kind of things in all, all types of cases dealing with hacking and, and sort of tech, technical crimes, but also in the national security crimes with terrorism. Because you just call somebody, you know, my name's Ahmed, that doesn't make me a terrorist. But, you know, if you all of a sudden uh, parsed a conversation I had with my parents where I said a whole bunch of stuff in Arabic, and then you put that before a judge and you said, well, judge, these words in Arabic are, you know, code, and neither the judge or the prosecutor or the, or the FBI understand what any of this stuff means, the next thing you know is you've got a conviction. And it's strange that you see these parallels with, with the hacking cases.
I would, I would like to give the audience a, a lot of time to ask questions, so you should start lining up now. I, I just wanted to give you a heads up, um, because a, a lot of people have lots of questions about the Manning trial, and there's a lot of um, things they need to, to know about it. So go ahead and do that. I, I wanted to ask uh, Chase, Ch the ACLU actually pays for your representation of her and all the costs associated with her case against the Department of Defense. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, how can people support Manning in her suit against the DOD? So I think one of the critical ways, and you know, I'm, I'm saying the same thing over and over again here, but one of the critical ways to support Chelsea, um, I think in general, is to continue to tell her story publicly as much as possible. And to do so, centralizing the fact that she is Chelsea, that she is a woman, and is sort of part of her narrative, because we really don't want that to be lost. So that's something that's just generally an important way to support her and sort of continue to give her the hope and the, you know, the optimism that she needs to continue to fight this for a long, potentially a long time. Now, the other thing that people can do is to sort of organize campaigns and to, con to continue to call, to call on the Department of Defense and the new uh, Secretary of Defense when, when that person is confirmed uh, to, to provide Chelsea with the treatment that she needs. Now, this, th there, there's nothing stopping the DOD and the officials at Leavenworth from treating her. They know that they should. They know it's consistent with medical standards, but it's uh, essentially a political issue that they don't want to... Uh, give in to her need for treatment, uh, in part because people, they don't think transgender people are legitimate and they don't take gender dysphoria seriously, but also in part because they don't like Chelsea. And I think we need to continue to call on them and show that the public is going to continue to pressure them to provide her treatment that is essentially a basic uh, rudimentary treatment that is provided for all sorts of other conditions that would pose no cost or risk to the government, um, and, but not to continue to withhold it simply because they don't take it seriously and they don't like Chelsea. And I think the public has a ton of power in this regard and not losing sight of that and continuing to call on the DOD um, and on Secretary of Defense uh, Hagel or uh, Carter, if, if Carter is confirmed, um, that's really going to be critical to her survival in the long term. And we can't lose sight of that. I, I, Nancy, I, you know, I know that uh, I, I urge people to donate to, Man to Manning's Legal Defense Fund. I mean, it, it, it's very expensive to be uh, prosecuted and, and convicted by the U.S. government for espionage and computer fraud and abuse uh, when you're a whistleblower. And you can do that at ChelseaManning.org. What can people do, Nancy, to support Manning during this appellate process, whether it's by legally or financially or emotionally? Oh, I agree with Chase. People can do all of those things. We, we work very hard to keep Chelsea's case alive. Uh, Alexa, you and I were just in Spain for a week talking all over the country about Chelsea. Amnesty International uh, made Chelsea one of their main people for this year so that she received hundreds, maybe thousands of letters. I was hoping there were enough letters that the prison just was overwhelmed with letters uh, it, for her. And she needs, she needs that support. We need support. Obviously, Vince, uh, my partner, Vincent Ward, and I are working on this case um, really as starting in the next month or so, practically full time. And, you know, we're private attorneys. We can't, we can't do this like the ACLU does for free. Um, so we need that support. This is a long case and we need to keep her case alive. We need to keep reminding people that even though this is an appeal, this is a, a, a viable appeal. We have very important issues here. We have issues that absolutely need to be heard by the court and Chelsea needs to win. And that's only going to happen um, if we can do our work and if people help keep this case alive around the world. So that's what I encourage people to do. ChelseaManning.org is run by the support committee. We don't have anything to do with it, um, but they are the ones who support the, our work and support Chelsea and make sure that she has enough money to 
She has uh, newspaper articles that she can read. You know, Chelsea also works really hard, and I, I don't want us to forget that. She works with us on our appeal. She works with Chase um, on their case. She writes regularly. She's She works so hard sometimes that she's overwhelmed by the amount that we ask her to do and that the public asks her to do. But it's also important for her to know that everyone is behind her uh, legally and morally and ethically. And so I hope all of you will do that and continue to do that. There's a question um, from number four. Yeah, um, Eric Holder has now said that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that the prohibition of sex discrimination would also encompass discrimination based on gender identity, including transgender status. Do you think that will be any help to Chelsea Manning? That the, the Civil Rights Act now uh, uh, should apply? Uh, Nancy, do you want to take that, or does anyone want to take that? Or do Chase, you... I think Chase should take that. Okay. I mean, I, I, don't, I can't speak for the appeal, although I imagine that it's probably not going to help too much on the appeal. Um, it, for, for purposes of her conditions of confinement case, unfortunately, uh, legally, it won't really um, make a difference because the Civil Rights Act won't apply to an Eighth Amendment claim. But I think what is important about that shift from the federal government in recognizing that discrimination uh, against transgender people amounts to sex discrimination for purposes of federal non-discrimination protections is that we're seeing a shift, at least in sort of public understanding of the fact that it is wrong uh, under our federal uh, laws, at least, to discriminate against people on the basis of their transgender status or their gender identity and expression. So I think it, it shows a shift that is promising. I do think, generally speaking, the Eighth Amendment has been clearly interpreted to apply to treatment for gender dysphoria. So we should legally be in a very clear position. Um, of course, you know, the courts don't necessarily follow the law um, be when it comes to people who are disfavored, and that's just the reality. So I think, again, going back to the public support, that's going to be critical just as much as the litigation is. Uh, Chase, you want to explain what the Eighth Amendment is to people who aren't Americans? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the Eighth Amendment to the United States uh, Constitution <laughs> prohibits cruel and unusual punishment uh, to people in, in custody. Uh, and, and so it applies uh, equally to military prisons. And actually, the, uh, the military has more expansive protection. So that will be relevant for purposes of the pretrial confinement aspects of, of Chelsea's conditions case. It won't be relevant for our case because we are filing in federal district court, not in military court. So the Eighth Amendment, uh, the, the less expansive version of the Eighth Amendment uh, will apply uh, in our case. Um, and, but that has been held to apply to medical treatment in addition to sort of physical treatment uh, and other forms of uh, you know, uh, cruelty that are, are posed on people in, in custody in the United States. Um, and, and it has been held almost universally by federal appellate courts to prohibit bans on treatment for gender dysphoria. So that's something that we're hoping will be instrumental in forcing uh, the court to, and, and then ultimately the DOD to provide Chelsea with the treatment that, we, that she needs. Now, hopefully it doesn't come to a court order and the government will, will do the right thing before we reach uh, a final resolution in court. So we're continuing to pressure them from all angles on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Number one, please. Yeah, I, I was just wondering uh, how many years do you think this will uh, uh, go until it reaches maybe the Supreme Court, maybe higher. So just how many years do we, you know, the, 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 does this, you know, how, how many years are we looking forward to <laughs> for the fight? This is a long fight. Um, and I can't tell you how many years. I can tell you that it's more than one or two years. We have two appellate courts. You know, the, the process is we will file a brief Sometime in 2015, uh, in the first court of appeals for the for the army, then the government will file a brief. They're going to take a long time because they're going to argue that they have to read this whole transcript and that they haven't been doing anything over the last year. Of course, we'll 
try to demand that they don't have as much time. But then we get to write a third, uh, there was a third brief. Then the court sets it for an oral argument. We will argue before the court and then the court has to rule. Uh, if we lose in that court, or even if the government loses, we can request that the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces hear the case. Although that's a discretionary appeal, it's very likely that that court would take the appeal in this case because it's such an important case. And again, there's a series of briefs written in that court. Uh, and then if, um, if the case is not resolved there, then it goes to the Supreme Court Again, that's discretionary. The Supreme Court can decide whether or not it wants to hear the case. If we've lost below, we certainly will do everything we can to try to get this case before the Supreme Court. But to answer your question, um, I can't tell you how many years, but I can tell you it's more than one, more than two. I have a follow-up question. To that Is there a difference between the U.S. Army Court of Criminal Appeals the first appellate court and the court of appeals for the armed forces in terms of what kinds of issues they'll consider? Like is, for example, is the higher military court for like matters of, of legal understanding, whereas the U.S. Army lower appeals court related to sort of like evidentiary issues or how the, tr is there any distinction between the two? I don't think so. Um, I think that it's just an appellate court. If you lose in the first one, you can go and ask that court to consider it. Now, in all these cases, we are bound by the record that was made below. That's the record we have. Um, we can't really, we can't add new facts. We can, we have that record. And that's the record that, that we have to rely on, which is the record that was made in the court below. We can ask in some circumstances for a remand back to the, to the first court in some instances, but whether we're going to do that or not, we haven't decided. Okay. Sorry. Great, thank you. Number two, please. So this is going to be a quite personal question about Chelsea. So if you believe she doesn't want this answered, please don't answer. <laughs> but I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, you said that uh, she does not get the treatment she needs uh, during her arrest. Did she actually have any of this treatment before her arrest? Or is that something that just wasn't possible while in service? Um, assuming this is a question about treatment for, for gender dysphoria, yes. um, she so so she uh, did not you know seek out treatment prior to her arrest uh, you know in central part because uh, the U United States military continues to uh, bar service by transgender individuals and in fact criminalizes uh, under the uh, the the military code of criminal uh, justice. Uh, you know, any cross gender expressions, which would include all treatment for gender dysphoria. So if she had sought treatment while she was in, uh, in the military, she, you know, she faced not only discharge, but also criminal, uh, liability. And so her ability to come to terms with her transgender identity was greatly diminished by being in the service, um, and, and the ban on, on trans people serving openly. And that's something that, you know, has, has affected her and continues to affect so many other people who are serving in the United States military who are transgender. Thanks. Um, are there any questions from, from the net? Yes, there are some questions. The first one is referring to discrimination of transgender people. Did the support for Chelsea Manning change after her coming out as a female? Uh, you know, I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just... Uh, Ahmed's picture changed. Yes, Ahmed. <laughs> so, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so, you know, Nancy may know more about the, the how the support has changed over time. Um, I think that uh, one thing that did happen is that the LGBT community became more supportive of Chelsea, I think, after she came out as transgender, and that was sort of part of her public narrative. And I think it's unfortunate, actually, that the LGBT community wasn't more supportive during her court martial and that, you know, she was an out gay person during that time, and she... Uh, you know, was also someone who, you know, was 
a, a critically important person for the for the United States and for the entire world. So I think it's a shame that the LGBT community didn't step up to be a real true advocate for her until after she came out as transgender. Um, but I do think that's a community where we saw increased support for her. And I think um, there's been some misunderstanding about her female identity from her supporters, and that's something to continue to sort of centralize in her narrative. But I do think overall we've seen, you know, consistent support for Chelsea, and hopefully that support will only grow over time. I, I want to just add something here from the court record that it was really interesting. Now that the, the, you've, you've filed this, Department of, this suit against the Department of Defense, a lot of sort of uh, puzzle pieces are fitting together from the court martial. Like, for example, uh, one of the documents found in Manning's um, dorm, sort of her military dorm, it was called a CHU, in Iraq, was a scholarly treatise on, um, on written by a U.S. Army, sorry, U.S. Air Force doctor. It was a study that was called uh, Flight into Hypermasculinity. And in this particular study, this U.S. Army Air Force doctor um, argued that the proportion of transgender people was higher in the military than in the general population because uh, trans women who identify as women but were assigned male at birth actually uh, will join the military to try to deal with their experience with gender dysphoria. Um, so there's all these kinds of, when you say that Manning wasn't treated for it, she was diagnosed with it before her arrest though. Yeah, that is correct. And she was diagnosed repeatedly every single time she saw a medical professional in the military. Right. And did, did she find herself trying to express her femininity while she was in Iraq or during that time period? Yeah, she did. And I think, you know, there, there's different ways to sort of look back on that time. She talks a lot about a leave she took while she was deployed in Iraq, in which time was the first time she really publicly lived as a woman and sort of outwardly expressed her gender as such. But I think, as you note, it's important to also recognize all the ways she ex she expressed her female identity that weren't sort of outwardly recognized as being uh, feminine or female and sort of understanding her condition. Um, and also it, it can't be sort of understated the extent to which she was, you know, a, an effeminate presenting person. She was a gender nonconforming person. She was always sort of identified and sort of recognized as such. And she also, you know, existed under don't ask, don't tell. She, she was someone who was constantly living under these conditions in the military. And she sought out ways to, to express that and come to terms with who she is as a woman, as a transgender person. And so that included things like dressing as a, as a woman when she was on leave um, and sort of trying to consolidate her identity, but also doing extensive research, trying to understand her condition, trying to figure out ways that she would be able to get treatment either, you know, before she left the military or after. And that is something that is, is very much there in the record and very much part of her story. Um, and and it, it shows how much the military was aware of her need for treatment for a very long period of time. I have a question from the European perspective to you guys. What can we do for Chelsea? I mean, you told from, from the American perspective that writing to the military, um, okay, donating, that's something we can do. But um, what can we do from here to support your case to support Chelsea? Well, there's... You can continue to talk about the case as you are now. You can continue to educate people about the case, about the problems that the whistleblowers have in the United States, that it's, it's virtually impossible now for anyone who um, has access to any information that the U.S. government considers to be national security to bring this to the public if, in fact, that person finds human rights abuses, as Chelsea did, if that person finds that the government is misusing the classification process. You know, it, it's, a, it's illegal to classify evidence in the United States for the purpose of Im avoiding embarrassment of the government. It's right in the executive order from the president that it cannot be used to avoid embarrassment. And yet that is how it's used. And we saw that in the torture report, obviously. And there's not one, there's a, there's an actual process 
that someone who has access to classified information that that person believes shouldn't be classified, there's a process within the law to go up the chain um, and say this shouldn't be classified. And it's never been successful, ever. And that that's part of the problem. So making this public, continuing to make it public, that people have to be treated fairly, that Chelsea needs to be treated fairly in prison, that Chelsea didn't have a fair trial, all of that is supportive of her as we go forward in this appeal. The world needs to keep this case in focus because it's so important. If we have a government in the United States that can protect its secrets, we can't have a free society. And that's just the bottom line. And everyone in the world needs to be concerned about that. Well, thank you very much. So we have can five I minutes and we have two more two can questions. I yeah. Um, number four, please. Um, I would like each and uh, everyone, I mean Nancy, Ahmed and uh, Chase, to answer me this truthfully and honestly, honestly, just with yes or no. And this is a personal question. After all of what you have witnessed, do you still believe in justice? That's a good question. <clears throat> I just started laughing. I'm going to say that loud. <laughs> okay, I'm the oldest, and I'm going to go first. Uh, <laughs> you are named first. <laughs> Look how young they are, both of them. Um, so I believe that there can be justice. I mean, I certainly believe in justice. I believe. Uh, that I want justice for all people everywhere. Do I believe that there can be justice um, anywhere, certainly in the United States? I'm not so sure. I've been a criminal defense lawyer for over 35 years. I've seen uh, a system that I did believe in, that I do believe is on paper a really good system. I believe that the jury trial system is a good system. I believe our system that requires confrontation of witnesses, which is different than the European system, is a really good system. But uh, I've seen too much now, and I'm not sure that most, that people who have issues, uh, gender issues, national security issues, uh, anyone who's Muslim in the United States, anyone who is a minority in the United States, I'm not sure any of those people get justice as the system um, exists today. And that's, uh, that's very distressing. I continue to work for it, and I will continue to work for it, and we just have to continue that struggle because we're, you know, lawyers particularly have tremendous power, and we have the power to create change, and that's what we have to continue to do is to use that power. Thank you. We have a very last question because we are running out of time. Um, number two, please, please keep short. So it's somewhat related to the last one, but um, so you spent some time telling us about the Espionage Act and things like that, that uh, Chelsea Manning was treated unfairly. So, and yet you're trying to help her through legal means again. So what makes you think it will work this time? I don't have any choice. I mean, what, you got some other idea? <laughs> no, I don't, but... I, you know, I, I don't have any choice. We, we have to rely on public, the public, the, the court of public opinion is a very important court. And there, there have been cases in the U.S. Supreme Court that have said the court of public opinion is important. And that's why we're here. And that's why we're talking to all of you. But we have, we have no choice. We have to go through the legal system. And we, that's what we'll do. Good luck. Maybe to have something else you can say to that. Thank you very much. I want to thank you guys for your time today. This has been really an awesome honor. So thanks a lot, guys. Um, thank you. I think it is um, fair enough to, to thank you for your awesome. Thank you for, for your work for, for Chelsea. And um, I think it is okay if we say, ooh, all the energy and all the love to Chelsea.
Absolutely. All the energy and all the love to Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're Great. finished. Okay.